It is the first Thursday of the month, and we are very excited to announce a new regular show here on uh, KODX that uh, will be every first Thursday of the month at 6 p.m. and is brought to us by none other than the Post-Prison Education Program. And its uh, founder and president, Ari Cohn, is with us live in the studios, as well as Catherine Gusick. And uh, glad to have you both here. And uh, take it away, Ari. Thank you, uh, Mike. So I thought, um, first of all, I want to, uh, uh, Catherine and I have been working on a town hall event. that's going to be June 20th. In the evening at, after Town Hall Seattle reopens, and I want to plug that and get it on everybody's calendar. So we, um, for a couple of years, I've been trying to uh, think of what the biggest issue is that I'm concerned about and um, it, in terms of the post-prison education program, former prisoners and prisoners, and certainly one of those issues is legislative cowardice, dishonesty on the part of government and legislators. But I think the biggest issue is criminalization of mental illness. So we've contracted with Pete Early, who uh, is the Pulitzer Prize winning author of, of Crazy and other books, former Washington Post reporter. And he's, and we've contracted with Town Hall. So Pete will be coming into Seattle June 19th, right? Yes. <laughs> and, 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 June 20th. Uh, but the event at Town <laughs> Hall is, yeah, the event at Town Hall is June 20th. At, but we're but basically, I think, six in the evening. It, it, yes. The doors will open uh, and we'll uh, walk out on the stage at seven and go till about 9 30. So, um, uh, I want to hope that everybody will get that on the calendar. And if, if you don't know the history of Pete and his book, Crazy, then Google it. Uh, his son uh, got caught up in the criminal justice system and subsequently died, um, like we're seeing happen with so many people. And uh, so, in, a, in about that time, he basically left the Washington Post and uh, began writing uh the book Crazy, which uh, we actually used as a textbook in 2012 when the, when the University of Washington Winter Quarter had a uh, honors program class based around the post-prison education program. And we, one of the textbooks we used for the week that dealt with mental illness was, 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 was crazy. So that's June 20th. I think it's a Thursday, right? Yes. Say right. <laughs> the crazy thing about crazy, though. The book, the novel, is that they really didn't want to publish it for a while, and then they actually finally did. So it, yeah, it's kind of they didn't what, want to. They didn't think that people would want to read about it, and it's such a powerful topic that people should, you know. And that's actually kind of the problem that we've had with the legislature and the public and mainstream media, uh, not wanting to even admit what's happening to people who suffer serious mental illness or admit to the fact that we've got uh, maybe 50% of Washington's prisoners diagnosed serious mental illness. So, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, we, or I, uh, I wanted a, a vehicle where I could be kind of unhinged, right? So I, where I could be, not politically correct and so a former board member of ours maggie wilkins set up a wordpress page for me called ari Cohn unhinged right and and the the idea was that it would be a blog and i could say anything i wanted so like on the post prison education program listserv i have to get that edited and i have to be careful and i can't use profanities for the most part, and I have to be PC, and we can't talk about one candidate versus another, but on Ari Cohn Unhinged, I should be able to do anything I wanted. So we put that up, or Maggie put it up, and then um, 
she put the Seattle Weekly cover story about the program on, on that page. And that's the only thing that's ever been put on that blog in two years because I, I've spent the last two years trying to figure out what issue it is that makes me more angry, more upset than any other. Because the idea was that I would, the first thing we kicked out off of that blog would be this, that one issue. And I, I, we still haven't figured it out. I haven't figured it out. I've, I, I sat at a Starbucks for the last couple of hours, still trying to just making notes and, and trying to list the things, um, that, that bother me the most. And I think, I think, um, what I've boiled down to is the title of the town hall event is going to be, uh, the biggest, the biggest, uh, I think, what are we calling it? Lie I ever told the, the biggest lie ever uh, told, ever told. And that, that biggest lie is the legislate legislature, the Washington state legislature, the governor's office, his advisors, whether John Lane or Sonia Hallam or, this whole parade of people that have been there through Gregoire and Gary Locke and now Inslee uh, want people to believe that recidivism is this unsolvable, mystical, mystical thing that can't be fixed and that they're trying their level best to, 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 to solve recidivism. And, that, and, and, and it's not mystical and it's easily solved. And it's solved at much lower cost than locking people up to the tune of thirty-five thousand four hundred forty dollars a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and the DOC, I mean, the, the post-prison education program has proven that. I mean, we we um, we were audited in two thousand nine. Eldon Vale was secretary of the DOC, and he sent me an email. He actually called me up seven thirty in the morning. And, um, it was raisin bran and bananas time. And I didn't expect the secretary of the DOC on my phone and the, you know, the economy had gone upside down. WAMU had crashed and it was now chase and, um, and, and Greg wire was telling agency heads, you've got to cut your budgets across the board, six or 7%. And El- and we were coming into the next legislative session, and Eldon told me he said, you know, data is significant, and 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 you you've got to have somebody study the effectiveness of of, of the work that the post prison education program's done. So, <coughs> excuse me. So what we did was we kind we kind of we've been being bugged by universities and other entities to do that for a long time, but I don't want to spend tens of thousands of dollars on fancy pants PhD researchers who are healthy and well housed. And so I always fought doing that. But when I had the secretary of the DOC on the phone saying, you, you, you really need to do this data is significant. It's important. Then I sort of acquiesced and I called a board member and we embarked on a $21,000 project to have researchers study the effect of this program on January 15th, uh, we, uh, of 2010, the researchers presented to Jim Hargo's committee at the Senate in a televised hearing that we had had nobody recidivate. And, and the room was packed. Senate hearing room one was packed with, with people from the department of corrections headquarters. And, um, and immediately the question became, uh, you know, why does somebody who's been to prison six times, I used to talk in terms of a guy named Keith Whiteman. Um, you know, why does somebody who, who he, Keith used to call himself a recidivating machine, right? So why is somebody who's been to prison six times and Mike, you know, Keith and, and, uh, uh, and just, you know, come out, recidivate, come out, recidivate. Why does that stop the minute they get involved with the post-prison education program? And so we were asked to hire somebody to research that issue and, 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 uh, uh, an anthropologist at UW did that study. And it turned out that it, it had very little to do with post-secondary education where, you know, our students are successful 
because we meet the legitimate, this is the language actually, we meet the legitimate frugal needs of former prisoners at the time they arise. And so that's such a simple formula. And so for Jay Inslee, who I, I, I like, I probably, I need to be a little PC. So, but for Inslee or his advisor, Sonia Hallam or John Lane before them or, or Roger Goodman, chair of the public safety committee or Jean, Jeannie Darnell in the Senate for them to pretend like stopping recidivism, putting the brakes on people returning to prison is this mystical, unsolvable crime, but they're heroically busting their butts to fix, fix the problem. Right. That's a lie. That's a, a, you said, I could say goddamn right. That's a goddamn lie. Um, and, and, and we've proven it. So in, in January, 2010, no recidivists. Um, we had worked with 282 people. Um, and, and, and so we, we moved on until 2015 and then funders, uh, foundations, large corporate funders and ind- large individual, what I call social venture funders started saying what we want to see what it looks like now. Right. And so we embarked on another study to have our effectiveness, uh, evaluated and um that time uh university of washington ended up working on we hired some researchers in 2015 that that i fired uh in november 2015 and then we turned to UW and we we uh contracted with them and they evaluated our effectiveness and they looked at 1746 people uh, that had gone through the program as of March of that, uh, of that year, uh, I think it was March 16th, March 2016. And we'd had 13 people recidivate, right? So they determined that, um, our recidivism rate was 7.87%. At the time, the, the, the DOC's recidivism rate was 32.2. The readmission rate of the DOC was was over 50 percent as of of april 2012 and uh and we were our students were 92 percent successful and again that's that's so it's simple it's you have people in your office who can make wise decisions about what's a legitimate frugal expense and when somebody needs something whether it's inpatient treatment or they've relapsed, or they need tutoring, or they need their rent paid, uh, if it's a legitimate frugal expense, you meet it. It can be even simpler than that, though. <laughs> yeah. Know, even getting diapers for your child or anything, really. Yep. It, it, it just, it, it, the whole thing is... It's, groceries, it, yeah. Groceries, bus passes. So we're, uh, so every time I see in the media, I've stopped going to Olympia. We, we're not, we... This year we didn't send a, a, a lobbyist down there, and I'll never again send a lobbyist to Olympia. It's a waste of money because Olymp- people in Olympia are a waste of money. Write it down. I said it. Um, uh, it, it, it this is really off the wall, but they're just engaged in, like, vaudevillian play acting down there. They want to act like they're doing something, uh, and it's fakery. They're fa- it's fakery. It's fakery. And, and so... We, uh, uh, but anyway, we just, uh, we've proven how to do it and it's, you just meet legitimate frugal needs. So, uh, I, what we're going to do at town hall on June 20th is, is talk about the biggest lie ever told. And we're going to have DOC data up there and our data up there and the university of Washington evaluation up there. And then we're going to talk about mental illness. Um, and, 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 and off of DOC data, talk about, um, how the state and nation have criminalized serious mental illness. So, um, I, th- I think I've settled. That's something along those lines is going to be the first thing we kick out of our icon unhinged, <laughs> which Catherine still has to write, right? <laughs> it's like, um, it, does treating people like, uh, human beings also count as a frugal need? 
Yeah. Because that's what I've observed. What That's one of the key things I've observed. You you treat the people that you're working with like um, they're real genuine people, which they are. Yeah. You know, and you don't treat them like criminals. Well, you're right. You know, you know what we do is we, we, we don't look back. So we look forward. Um, we, we meet people where they're at now. We let them tell us what their dreams and hopes are for the future. And we just, we just go to work for them and, and, and try to facilitate their, their lives becoming better. And, and, and we get involved with their kids. Um, I'm so, uh, I'm like, off the wall excited right now about uh and everybody who knows her is so like um i probably i'm not gonna I, i'll just leave it at jenny but but so we you know 2010 so we've got a student who's being recruited by yale university that's kind of off the hook multiple multiple incarcerations um first Drug use at age six. At age four, she watched her father be arrested by by police and hauled away for a life sentence. Um, locked up twice with her own mother. Um, but uh, now she now she you know she had a, a son taken uh, taken away by CPS and put in foster care, and she's un- overcome all that. And, you know, she walked in her our door. She busted in our door like a nuclear explosion in December 2010. And uh, hello, Jenny, if you're listening. And, and, uh, and um, we worked with her to go to Shoreline Community College, and then later we worked with her to go to uh, South Seattle College, and she uh, graduated there with high honors. Um, and uh, recently was uh, was honored as one of the top students in the state by Ensley and and others in Olympia at a luncheon. Um, and I, I started to go out of my way to let him know that there was four prisoners and uh, four former prisoners and one real actual prisoner in the room with him. But I was afraid he wet his pants and flee, so we just kept it. We I just kept my mouth shut. But. Um, she's been accepted at the University of Washington and, uh, and then became a semifinalist with the Jack Kent Cooke Foundation Scholarship Competition. And at that point, Columbia and Yale started reaching out to her. So uh, fierce mom, pro- protective. Yeah, no, she's a strong woman. Really, I, I she hear, can, I, she's proven she can do anything she wants. Yeah, she's, she's, so that just came out of like recognizing her humanity, getting involved with her family, with her kids, and and maybe we spent, I think we spent a little over thirteen thousand dollars over the last nine years. If we if 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 we had stayed out of the picture based on history, you'd had. Years and years and years of thirty-five thousand four hundred in DOC prisons, but once we got involved and just did what you just said, recognized humanity, uh, treat them like human people, meet the legitimate frugal needs, then she just set the world on fire. Um, so there's, uh, so that so that's 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 the big lie. Recidivism is easily solved and. Uh, uh, and for some reason, the governor doesn't want to hear about it. The Department of Correction doesn't want to hear about it. The the legislature won't won't fund it, um, and and it's it's just kind of you know it's kind of ridiculous. I want and when it comes to funding, I want to talk about um, uh, a- anything you two want to talk about. But I was so like interrupt me, throw something at me, please, but bail me out. But I uh, I uh, uh, want to talk about some specific examples of dishonesty. Uh, the, and there's uh, over the last 15 years, I've got this whole mental parade of dishonest things I've listened to the people in government say. Right, and 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 some of them are really small, but they indicate what. They indicate 
like fakery or ignorance or something. So like, I mean, I was thinking today, I called Jeannie Darnell's office to get a bill number because a couple of years ago I was waiting to testify in Roger Goodman's committee, public safety committee in the house. And Jeannie came over to testify in front of her bill for, uh, which was a, a, a two year identicard. For, and is she a, a legislator? She's a, she's, yeah, she's a Senator. She was in the house for years. Now she's in the Senate. And, uh, and when she testified on this bill for Identicard, I almost fell on my chair because her testimony was that, that Rogers committee should vote that out of committee and approve it because it would reduce recidivism. And I'm like, and I was just, I was just like blown away. And identity cards are important. It's important to come out of prison and have identification. So you can go to the bank, you can go to the post office. You, you can, you can get your social security card if you don't have one, but it's not going to reduce recidivism. And for her to represent to, to Rogers committee that they should pass this bill, which this most recent year is Senate bill 55, 58, because it'll reduce recidivism and an ID card will reduce recidivism. I, I was like, and I wouldn't even tell you what I was, I, you know, like, are you high or are you intent? You assume the people that are, you're listening, that are t- listening to you are, are ignorant to the point they would believe this, or you're ignorant to the point that you believe it, or you're just play acting. And, and, uh, so that's, that's dishonesty and fakery on a, a small scale, but on a, a larger scale, you know, I don't, uh, I, th- a, a driving force for recidivism beyond doubt, and many people in the department of corrections agree with this is county of origin. And it, uh, that was put in, that came into law in 2007, um, when uh, was Senate Bill six one five seven, which was a huge omnibus bill, um, and and that language, county of origin language, never saw a hearing, not one minute of a hearing. It was put into the bill. In fact, the bill was created after Sine died, so the legislature by law ended at five o'clock on on a day. A bill, uh, I think it was uh, fifty seventy died because Frank Chop didn't have time that day to call it up and it was the last day of session. So it just died. Jim Hargrove, Jeannie Darnell, Debbie Regala, Mike Carroll, who's deceased, wanted to um wanted this county of origin language and they wanted a year's worth of work on this reentry task force to not go down the tubes. So they got together after the session was ended and and moved everything that they wanted from 5070 into 6157 right and and and, and left stuff that they didn't want out that had been in 57 which had been in hearings right and and they just moved it into this new bill created the number it was 6157 and then the the Pierce County delegation to the legislature they were having to contend with an alcoholic prosecuting attorney, Jerry Horn. And so, and he had made County of origin and Pierce County being a dumping ground be a huge issue. And so to get the Pierce County delegation support for 6157, they had, the legislature had to go along with putting County of origin language in and, and they did. But so, so if you get a copy of that bill and read page one of that bill, uh, and you read the county of origin language, you're reading language that became law that, that governs what the DOC does and doesn't do when they release people, uh, that never got voted on, never saw the light of a day in a hearing, didn't come into existence until Sonny Die had come and gone, uh, was just created by a bunch of people after five o'clock, uh, that, wanted that to be law. And, and, and so since 2007, people coming out of prison have had to contend with being forced to go back to the one place they should never have to go to, which is the county where they committed the crime that put them in prison. Um, you, you know, we had, uh, we, we deal with it weekly. It, it, you just don't want somebody to go back where they know all the wrong people and they don't know any of the right people. You know, you know, every drug dealer, you know, every, every, everybody that put you in prison that led to you going to prison, you know, those people, 
in this county and where you where you got had your crime and th- those those people you do need you don't want to see you don't need to be around so like we just took Josh Winchester who I had with me on KEXP Mike with you uh just a couple months ago and his daughter Trinity um he was releasing from his sixth imprisonment and um the DOC would have sent him back to back to Bellingham, right? Again, where he knows all the wrong people. And, and I told the superintendent, who I like a great deal, uh, I consider a personal friend at, at, at Larch, uh, that we would help Josh, we would work for Josh, if there was a county of origin exception issued, right? And, and, and Lisa approved it and sent it up the line to DOC headquarters, and they released Josh to King County, where he knew he didn't know any good people or bad people. He just knew us. He had no relationship here. But importantly, not back to Whatcom County, where he had had six crimes and six imprisonments come from, right, in 20 years of being locked up. Um, And, you know, about three weeks ago, he finished his first quarter at uh, North Seattle College. He's clean and sober. Uh, his probation, his CCO with the DOC, I think respects his, him and what he's doing. Um, he's just doing extremely well. He's a full-time employee of the post-prison education program. He's reunited with his children. Um, and, and, and in fact, his daughter, Trinity, was with Josh out at North Seattle getting her enrolled early, earlier this week. So not so county of origin is just like maybe one of the bigger examples of dishonesty and and uh we're gonna what which leads to i want to announce another thing that Catherine and i've been working on so like i think most of you or many of you have seen this uh program this movie called spotlight so the boston globe has a team called spotlight team and sasha pfeiffer uh, and the others at the Boston Globe investigated the Catholic Church for quite a while, and then out of that came this really good movie, right? And, but I love the term spotlight. And so I wrote, to, Sasha's now with uh, NPR, and I, I wrote to her, and then I wrote to Dan, their general counsel at the Boston Globe, and asked if we could have permission to use the term spotlight. So we've got the clear... Uh, you know, we've got the clear go-ahead to, to, to talk about finding an issue and spotlighting it. Um, and so future monthly ap- uh, appearances or whatever you want to call it on, on, on KODX will be pretty much one-issue things where, we, where we've, pre- we've chosen the previous month to investigate something and, and then spotlight it, Right. And, and, and shine a glaring light on it and talk about people and name names and, 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 and try to get people to take corrective action. So um, in addition to, to the town hall event that I wanted to announce, we, I wanted to uh, announce that this, the spotlight, we're kicking the spotlight effort off. And, and in the future, uh, if you return to listening to people that will be on our show other than me because I'm not going to be here every time, and, I, and most times I'm not. And, 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 and we're looking for guests, and we're looking for topics, and we're looking for issues to research. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we will have spent a month detail, you know, really looking at, at issues that, that, um, that I think are costing lives. And, and uh, so we're like, we're doing good. We've got six – I've been running my mouth. It's 629. <laughs> We got 30 minutes to go, so I'm I'm, I'm gonna um, I want to talk about Inslee some more, Sonia Hallam some more, and Tim Ormsby especially, and Roger Goodman uh, as part of a conversation about House Bill 2025, which Ormsby killed two years in a row, and which Roger Goodman could have done a med- a major better job working, um, and and. and and I want to talk about 2025 in light of some research that came out of the University of Washington, which is right across the street from us. Um, 
Mark Stern used to be uh, Assistant Secretary of the Health Division of the Department of Corrections, and he is now, I guess, uh, what you would call a research professor at, uh, at UW. And he and uh, a medical doctor, Ingrid Benswanger, and I hope I'm saying Ingrid's last name correctly, but it's B-I-N-S-W-A-N-G-E-R, <coughs> and others did a 2007 research project. And they, they looked at the morbidity of, of people coming out of prison, and, and, and they determined that about 70 former prisoners Washington State prisoners are dying every year from overdose or suicide within less than two years of their release. And when I, when I saw that study years ago, it just, I was staggered. I mean, people think that I'm go overboard with uh, how strongly I feel about a lot of these issues, but I keep thinking to myself, people are dying, you know, it, and I think if people weren't dying in the high numbers that uh, that they are dying, I would be way more toned down. But we've seen death face to face, you know, uh, and, and we've had students and applicants of ours die from suicide. Uh, we've had uh, 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 we're. I've seen DOC data that's just disturbing. You'll never see the DOC data that, that, that's available that we see all the time and have in a legislative hearing. Roger Goodman would have a heart attack before he put up DOC data showing the, that, that 53% of former prisoners return to prison with, with, within their lifetimes, right? You'll never see Jeannie Darnell having a hearing about uh, about the fact that more than 34% of Washington's prisoners are designated S code two, three, four, five or worse. And those are indications of serious mental illness. You want, you know, so we're, we're seeing all this. And then we saw Mark's study showing this high rate of, of morbid morbidity. And, and by the way, nationally it's over 4,400. So with dying from overdose or suicide within two, less than two years of the release. So a couple of years ago, I reached out to Mark, and 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 I asked him if he and Ingrid had updated that study, and they had. So in 2013, they had updated it, and it was published in 2015, and the numbers held true. The numbers held true. So about somewhere between 67 or 70 human beings, men and women, people coming out of prison have died every year from every year within less than two years of their release in this very small state we live in. We live in a little piddly ass state. You know, Washington is a small state. There's a lot of towns in this country that are bigger than this whole state population wise that really. And so to have 70 people dying from overdose or, or, or by suicide a year, year in and year out, that's just insane. It's in, and, and it's wrong, and it's not justifiable. And for Inslee and Sonia Hallam and the Roger Goodmans and the McCoys and and Jeannie Darnells of the world to be playing political games with these lives is it's egregious. I mean, I don't actually have the right words for it. And and then and then when you look at it uh, nationally, again, it's almost five thousand people. And, um, so it's just, that's, so what do you attribute that to? Because you literally have known some of these people where this has happened to. Well, I mean, I, I think they're, they're coming out to what I, I told somebody, uh, I was talking to somebody at, at Google headquarters yesterday in California talking by email. We normally talk, we talk a lot, we text a lot, but, but. And, but I, the way I, and also a foundation manager uh, with a very large local foundation. Uh, to, to me, the way I put it is reentry is so horribly bad for people, you, you know, that, that they choose to die rather than continue the battle. I mean, that's really, that's really what happens. Uh, and, and that, I mean, that's it. They, it's, the wealthy prisoners, when there are wealthy prisoners, they're in the federal prisons, right? 
in the state, at least in this state, there are there might be one or two wealthy people. I don't think I've ever met them. For the most part, people in our prisons in this state are, are come from abject poverty. They have there for the most part. There's no education. Uh, there's DOC information that 78 percent of Washington's prisoners have drugs and addiction in their life. And David Daniels, who used to be in charge of data and research uh, with DOC, and uh, and I wish he still was, um, uh, told me he thinks it's higher than that. Um, and then, and then the, the, this uh, really disturbing data um, on the degree of people suffering mental illness. I'm just going to. I'm watching my clock, but um, me- mental illness, it, county of origin, and mental illness, drugs and addiction. That's that's it. If you address those things, get poverty out of the way by edu- by way of education. That. You know, it's the problem solved, and and, and we've proven it can be can, can be solved. I mean, we've proven it for 14 years. So, like, I don't know how we got it, but uh, I mean, we asked for it, obviously. But um, there's a data set from the Department of Corrections that shows uh, the percentages of people. It shows their S codes, so it takes the population of the Department of Corrections. And looks at it over a 15-year period, right? So, and and by columns, S code zero is unclassified, and that 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 a person could go through male or female intake at Shelton or Purdy and not be classified uh, is I, I don't even I don't know the words. For that that's so wrong because so many people schizoaffective disorder borderline personality disorder to or, or healthy to not be classified as insane and 22,000 people 22,000 people went through male and female intake in the Department of Corrections in a 15-year period and didn't get classified at all so that's S code zero uh, and I, I and, and for people that aren't familiar, what does S code well, mean? I'm is gonna, that like sanity? Or? So no, so it it, it it it's an indicator of mental mental illness. Okay. So, um, so S code zero is unclassified. S code one is mentally healthy, which brings up another issue that that I want to talk about, uh, and that's scarily dishonest. S code two, three, four, and five are are indicators of serious mental illness. And I've got an email from DOC that that says I'm right to basic, basically exclude PTSD, exclude ADHD from, from from that, and just think in terms of schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, borderline, and bipolar. So this it's just and, and, and so if you take the if you take this one this data set and you total up everybody that's in the S code two three four five column, it's thirty four percent of Washington's prisoners, and the DOC can't deny it. It's their damn data, um, and 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 I and I don't think they would try to deny it. And and, by, and I want to by the way I want to emphasize I need to emphasize this and it's really important to me to emphasize it that you know. But the bad guys on the block aren't the Department of Corrections, as far as I'm concerned. It's the Washington State Legislature and the God be damned governor and the governor's worthless advisor, Sonia Hallam, and people they're the they're the enemies. They're the people that don't give the DOC the money they need uh, to solve the problems. And they don't and they and they don't give nonprofits who with proven ability the money they need to solve the problem. Uh, they just piddle around and have these fake ass, re, re, you know, like Inslee's got this committee that's supposed to figure out how to reduce recidivism. They meet in fancy pants places and spend money and on travel and this, that, and the other and pay salary to an executive director who's, who, who I like. But they're not anymore going to – it's just fakery. It's like trying to tell the public that they're doing something when, in fact, it's – they're really not, and they, you know, recidivism will continue to climb as it has for the last 15 years. Uh, readmission rates will continue to be insanely high, 
but um, the the uh, that thirty four percent's not deniable. It's it's a it's a DOC data set. People can write to me at re.cone at postprisonedu.org. I'll send it to you. Uh, I'd love to send it to you. re.cone at postprisonedu.org. So, um, it, it, so, so then what happens is if you say, okay, 22,000 people went through male and in female intake and didn't get classified, you know darn well some percentage of them would have been classified not healthy. They would have been classified as, as S code two, three, four, five, right? So that 34% is bonkers, right? It might be 40%. It might be 45%. Um, I think it could be 50%. Um, and, and, and so that's like a, that's a, that's, you know, hiding that information, not talking about it, um, you know, uh, not doing anything about it. That's just wrong. I, on a, I, 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 the whole thing with me is it's become a moral imperative. When people are dying, fixing, and, and there are 82% of those people who are dying are parents with 1.91 children, right, according to DOC data. And, and so when, when it's that bad and so many people are dying from overdose and by suicide, then it, it rises to the level of being a moral imperative. But try to get the Jeannie Darnells and the Roger Goodmans and the Rod, you know, the Ensleys and the John Lanes and uh, Bernie Warners. Thank God he's gone. And and uh, you, you know, to pay attention to that issue and and do something is just you might as well go bark at a tree or something like that, or have the tree bark at you, whatever it is. It's because it's just not it's not happening. For 15 years, I've watched it not happen. And uh, so th those are the kind of issues we're going to kind of spotlight, and I and I'm, I'm looking at a I'm looking at the budget, the 2017 budget, and going back to House Bill 2025. In our past lobbyist emailed this to me on my birthday, which is, was a, 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 a horrible birthday present, but it was like when 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 Ormsby killed 2025, you know in. You know, there's people that say, that guess why he did it. You know, he didn't understand it, or Roger Goodman didn't work it. You know, I've got a, a, an email from our lobbyist saying this, it's 100% fact that the bill failed one year because Roger Goodman just didn't work it. You know, he didn't even go over to appropriations to testify on behalf of his own bill. Uh, and and it, but it didn't it didn't get called up, it, and it died two years in a row. So Roger. Um, w went to work, I think maybe out of embarrassment uh, because it died in appropriations and because he didn't bother to, to go over to Ormsby's committee and testify for his own bill, um, which passed unanimously out of public safety, all Republicans, all Democrats passing. It was a wise bill. Um, Roger went to work, and he got it put in the budget, right? Right. And so, uh, and he, I saw the letter he wrote, and it had the language from House Bill 2025 pretty accurately in there. And it's, it's, it's really simple. It's like the government, the DOC cannot fund an, an entity that hasn't been proven to significantly reduce recidivism. I mean, why would you want to refund some entity that hasn't been proven to reduce recidivism significantly? And where they have been funding entities that have not been proven to reduce recidivism significantly, they have to stop funding them and repurpose the money to entities that have proven their ability to reduce, and, and that's the post-prison education program. But uh, So Roger got that language into the, into, the, into the bill, and then that was the year where Inslee had to, like, call this legislature back into se session time and time again because you had the Republican Senate and the Democratic House, and they, and they kept not agreeing on big issues. Finally, you know, there's a conference committee, a bunch of Republicans, a bunch of Democrats, and they sit down in a back room, and they, and they uh, negotiate out these things. And so then the, the, finally the budget was settled. And, and uh, on June 30th, our past lobbyist mailed me the budget. And on one four, page 146, 
It says the Department of Corrections shall use funds appropriated in this subsection for offender program. And by the way, I hate the word offender. They're mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, aunts, uncles, students, anything but offender. The depart prisoner, former prisoner. If you're in prison, you're a prisoner. Call it what you're doing. So like, but the department shall develop and implement a written comprehensive plan for offender programming <coughs> that prioritizes programs which follow the risk needs responsive responsivity model are evidence based, blah, blah, blah. And then it gets down, and this is a sentence that killed me. It's like the department is authorized to is authorized to discontinue ineffective programs and to repurpose under uh, underspent funds, right? To, to, to have all that conference committee authorize the DOC to do what it's always been authorized to do, which is to fund or not fund programs was some was like deceptive, uh, disingenuous, dishonest, fakery. I mean, you don't need the D you don't need that language to tell the DOC they can do what they're already authorized to do. They didn't need this language to say that they're authorized to discontinue ineffective programs. That's always been the case. It'll always be the case. And so, so they took this required language that like you will not fund, you shall not fund ineffective programs or unproven programs. When you find unproven programs, then you'll, you'll stop funding them and you'll repurpose the money to proven entities. Right? Uh, so that, that, that what I, when you come to spotlighting, the first thing I want to do is have somebody find out who the people on that conference committee were that, that, that watered House Bill 2025 language down. And, and I guarantee you on June 20th at Town Hall, I'm going to have their pictures on the screen. When you come upstairs into the big auditorium, the first thing you're going to probably see is, is Inslee's picture and the, the logo will be something like public enemy number one. And then, and then, and then, and then right behind that on a PowerPoint will be the, the people who watered down this language into nothingness. But and it, it's important to spotlight that because they're responsible for people dying. And I, I you know, we're down to six forty eight, and, and, uh, and I would, I would just, I want to talk about, um, our numbers, right? So when the, in the course of the UW evaluation of our work with these 1,746 people, um, we, um, we were constantly pulling data from the data we were getting. And, 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 uh, one of the, th one of the things since 2010, I have wanted desperately to do is focus all of our resources on the on high needs people i go it makes me crazy when 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 i see government or nonprofits investing resources and in people who can make it on their own you know people who won't recidivate uh whether money spent on them or not they're low doc data shows that basically people who are risk level low or moderate don't recidivate they make up about 10 14 percent of recidivists the people who do recidivate are and make up 77 percent of recidivists are in the high risk you're high, high violent high nonviolent, high property but the word high is in there right and so um i wanted like a hundred percent of the people that we spend money on to be high risk because i want to focus resources on the people who might die or recidivate right and i also want a hundred percent or as close to it as we can get of, of the people that we're spending money on to, to be the people that are suffering mental illness. Uh, and so we, we looked at the data we were getting, you know, with the administrative office of the courts, Washington state Institute of public policy, DOC, all authorized the, a lot of data on these 1,746 people to be given to the researchers. So, um, and we uploaded that into our sales force, right? So we, we found out that 74.23% of our applicants as of March 2016 were high risk to recidivate. I was thrilled with that. I wanted it to be 100%, but I was thrilled that it was 74.23%. Then we found out that 78% of our actual students, the piece of, who people who went from applicant to be an actual students, 
78% were high risk to recidivate. And then 48% of that 78% have been diagnosed seriously mentally ill or are or, or indicated by the DOC to be S-Code 2345. And so we're working with people who are in dire straits. They're the recidivating machines. They're the people that are overdosing and, and dying from suicide. And we're 92.13% successful, right? So... I mean, what more needs to be said? Uh, but we we can't we're you know we 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 can't we couldn't get a penny out of the Washington State government if God held an Uzi to somebody's head down in Olympia. It just it, and it makes no sense. It makes no sense. So those are the kind of issues we're going to try to uh, try to highlight in future shows. Um, I wish we had a call in. I wish we could do call in. For we'll work on that. Okay, good. <laughs> so, like, um, I want you know. So, I, I want to like kudos to Mike McCormick. I think like three. How many years did you work to get this license? Oh, I think we started about 2013. So. Yeah, and 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 and, uh, and finally got a license for. KODX 96.9, where these kinds of issues that Tom Mara and KEXP recently killed uh, can be can be discussed. And uh, uh, it was a, it was a long battle. And I don't know if you always thought that you were going to get the license. I wasn't sure. I thought it was uphill, and I don't think real highly of the federal government. And I thought it might be. I did, yeah, I didn't think the the weakness was on the government, and I thought it was going to uh, be more uh, raising funds and uh, and still get is. it still is yes so. as as well as with your organization. <laughs> I mean, it's people that do um, not that I'm including myself in this, but uh, of the different organizations I see in the uh, Greater Puget Sound region doing all the great work, they're all struggling to um, you know fund their operations and um, you know keep their the people that are working uh, in the trenches um, sane. So, you know, I just, uh, um, if you go to, if you go to, um, doc.wa.gov and type in this name, Polston, or look for the inmate search and then you type in P O L S T O N, we have his information in, um, in our data thanks to Administrative Office of the Courts and WISIP and DOC. And it, his life tells the story of the consequence of people suffering mental illness better than anybody I know who's alive to tell it. So, uh, and, he, and he and I have never met, uh, but he's responsible for our focus on... Um, on people suffering mental illness and the way that came about is we've got six minutes it is in 2010 he was about to release from what's called the special offender unit at Monroe and a counselor uh, you know there's, uh, there's there's really so many good people in the DOC there really are and, and the, and this lady who's retired now reached out to me and she said, she said, Ari, if you don't get involved with this guy, uh, he can't make it. You know, he can't come out and be successful and not die or overdose or recidivate. Um, and so I sent, I told the story on KXP last time we were on, on mine over matters, but I sent, uh, a PsyD, so somebody with the equivalent of a PhD in psychology, and a, and a, somebody else with a four-year degree in human services up to SOU. Scott Frakes, who's now head of DOC in Nebraska, facilitated them being able to sit down and interview this guy for three hours. And um, when, the, when, when Corey and Holly left the prison that day, Corey sent me a, a text. They were in the same car, but Corey sent a text and said, Ari, he's too sick. Holly sent a text and said, Ari, he's so sick, we have to help. So we made a commitment to help, but we never saw him. 
and County of Origin, Jeannie Darnell's County of Origin, Debbie Regala's County of Origin, uh, Jerry Horn's County of Origin, Senate Bill 6157's County of Origin, forced him to go back down to Clark County, where there's no, they don't have the resources or, or they don't have the Navos or, 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 the, or, or the places that can deal with somebody who's almost psychotic with schizoaffective disorder. And that was his diagnosis. And so I was, I, I, at that point he had been to prison nine times, um, nine times. I, if I could actually open up Salesforce right here, cause we're online and tell you when his first incarceration was, when he came out, when he recidivated and it just come out, recidivate, recidivate. Recidiv- cause if you're, if you're, if you if you're living in abject poverty and you're not born to wealth and your diagnosis is schizoaffective disorder, you're fill in the blank the word you won't let me say on the air, right? You're 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 screwed. I can say that, right? Okay, and, and you're going to go back to county of origin and live some form of hell until you die or you catch a new case and you return. So, I was writing to Roger about the inane definitions that WISIP has developed for, for like evidence-based and research-based and so on. And they're just plain Donald Duck, Daffy Duck, goofy and wrong. And I, and I, something made me look, go back and and look and see if he was back in prison. And he was, I just went to doc.wall.gov, clicked on the inmate button and he was back. So then I called a friend at DOC and I'm like, when did he go back? And, uh, when, what's his, what's his earned release date, right? And he had gone back the previous March, and I think his ERD was something like 2024. So he had four, he'd been back a year, and he had four or five more years to go. And it's because he's, his diagnosis is schizoaffective disorder. And he, and, and, so he, and he comes from extreme poverty. So he, and he, he just can't, he can't live legally without assistance. And, 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 but with assistance, maybe he could. In, 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 in our history, nine people out of 10, like Jeremy Polston, have been able to live successfully. And the goddamn legislature won't fund it. So F you, Roger, F you, Jeannie, F you, Sonia. And we got two minutes to go. And if you want to know how I really feel about it, write me an email and I'll let you know. And that email address again is? ra.cone at postprisonedu.org. A-R-I dot K-O-H-N. At, at postprisonedu.org. Um, so it wasn't clear. I think I know the answer. But so when they are returned to county of origin, are they not allowed to leave that county? Well, then they have to, the DOC has to, you know, they, they, they have required to. required to live there? They still have, as long as they're on paper, on probation, they have to. They would have to ask for a county of accept an exception to county of origin, and that would have to work its way through DOC all the way to headquarters. And and and, and honestly, I, and I, one minute to go. Uh, one thing Roger Goodman has done well in the last years is he is he had hearings on county of origin, and out of those hearings, we ended up thanks to Dan Pachoki. Uh, with uh, a really good working relationship with the DOC. So when we ask for an exception, we, we're, we're, we're getting it. Uh, so, but they'd have to go back and ask for the exception. All right. Ari Cohn with the Post-Prison Education Program. And uh, one more time, uh, your contact info and... And tell us about the uh, the event on the twentieth. That uh, the it's titled "The Biggest Lie Ever, uh, Ever Told," and it'll be on June twentieth on a Thursday. All right, and uh, it's going to be at Town Hall, Seattle. Yeah. They, Town should, Hall, be, they Seattle. should be back in gear at their uh, yeah. It starts facility. Uh, doors open at six and until nine. All right, looking forward yeah. to that. And again, you have one more time, uh, A-R-I dot K-O-H-N at postprisonedu.org. Is that yeah, correct? or go to Facebook and search Post Prison Education Program. Click like on the page. Uh, our website is something we haven't focused on, but Catherine is 
is working on it. Yes, she's, I'm starting she's, that. It's junk, but it, yes, it's there. Yes, definitely. <laughs> we'll fix that right up and make it look so snazzy. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, looking forward to uh, your show again next month, first Thursday, 6 p.m. Thank you.